a real physical place. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that is far beyond all comparison. Anyway, check out 2 Corinthians 11 sometime for a record of what Paul is calling light and momentary afflictions. Because you could say, oh, well, this guy, whoever he is, he doesn't really know. What, the kinds of afflictions that I've been facing. Well, he lists these light and momentary afflictions. Prison, flogging, five times the 40 lashes minus one, three times beaten with rod, stone, shipwreck, spent a day and night in the open sea, rivers, bandits. Uh, you know, he talks about danger from Jews, danger from Gentiles, danger everywhere he went, uh, often without sleep, hungry, thirsty, uh, naked, cold, and then he says, on top of everything else, is this burden that I have for the churches. And again, if this is light and momentary, what could Paul be talking about? Because does it seem almost offensive? I mean, my wife is in stage four cancer right now. Uh, uh, it's, it's in her lymph nodes. Um, um, our dear dog is, is dying of cancer. Uh, dear friends who are facing everything, a, a, a close friend whose wife is struggling with dementia. Okay, so does it seem like an insult to call these light and momentary sufferings? Well, what we got to do, I think, is, is uh, weigh them against what's on the other side of the scales. That's what Paul is saying to do. That's the eternal weight of glory. And, and it's like, okay, so you maybe you feel like your sufferings are the rock of Gibraltar. I mean, that's a big rock, right? That's really heavy, incredibly heavy. But then what if on the other side, God placed on those scales the planet Jupiter, you know, or a galaxy, you know, or the universe itself. And then all of a sudden you go, wow, okay, this is an eternal weight uh, of glory. And, and that's what God is, is telling us uh, in, in verse 20 of Romans 8, following uh, where Paul has said what he does about light and momentary uh, afflictions or a par parallel passage to that, that is. He says, for the creation was subjected to futility as we human stewards uh, fell the the, the whole creation fell under us. It fell on our coattails. And, and this is the curse. And, and God has put into us a, a nostalgia for an Eden that, you know, we've never really known. We've never really uh, experienced Eden firsthand, but, but we have this sense that that's the way it's supposed to be. And something is badly wrong with this world. And that's what Romans 8 is telling us. Something is badly wrong. In verse 21, it says, in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The same creation that fell on humanity's coattails shall rise on its coattails. That's what we're told in this great passage. Verse 22 says, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pangs of childbirth until now. But the groaning is not death. You know, it's the difference between death and childbirth. It's the coming of new life, even with its pains. And, and it says in this passage that the whole creation, not just people, but the whole creation suffers. Well, what else suffers besides uh, human beings? Well, figuratively, forests and mountains and meadows, maybe. But literally, animals experience suffering. Um, and not only the, the whole creation, but we ourselves, we're told in the next verse, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the, the adoption as God's children, the redemption of our bodies. So the whole creation is groaning as it awaits something. And what it awaits is the redemption of our bodies. That's the resurrection. And the resurrection is the key. Understanding the resurrection is the key to understanding heaven and the nature of the eternal heaven God has in store for us. Resurrection is the hinge also upon which the problem of evil and suffering 
uh, turns. So again, it's what's what's on that other side of uh, of suffering uh, that everything else, um, our life here uh, pales in comparison to. So the key to creation's redemption is our own resurrection. And the resurrected Christ said to the apostles, look at me, the resurrected Jesus. He says, look at me, look at my hands, look at my feet. It is I myself, the same Jesus who walked this earth with you. It's like Job says in Job uh, 19, 19, uh, believing that I, I, I know one day I will see my Redeemer on a new earth. I will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. Um, the resurrected Christ said to the apostles, look at my hands, my feet. It's I myself. He says, touch and see. Um, he said, uh, I'm not a ghost. He says, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as I have. So he's telling us about his resurrection body. It has flesh and bones. And remember how he ate and drank with the disciples? And, and what did he do? Uh, you know, I mean, the, the food stayed inside of him. You know, it didn't fall through him like he was a ghost. Um, and he actually uh, fixed breakfast for the disciples. And he was with them 40 days in a physical resurrection body. He says, you know, touch me, handle me. He says to, to Thomas, you know, see who I really am. This is really me. Um, so Christ's resurrection body, we're told in scripture, is the first fruits or the prototype of ours. He walked the earth. We will walk the earth. The resurrected Jesus occupied space. We will occupy space. And yes, there will be time, though I don't have time right now to get into that. But it's, it's not just our bodies that will rise. It's the earth itself. It's not just that God redeemed us, but he's going to redeem the whole world. You know, sometimes we think we look at the early chapters of Genesis and God designed man and woman to rule the earth to his glory. And then we think, we imagine sometimes, oh, Satan, Satan destroyed all that. Satan completely dismantled the plan of God because men and women, I mean, how many men and women in all history knew what it was to rule the earth to the glory of God? I mean, Adam and Eve. And then sin and curse came into the world. Uh, but God teaches that Satan didn't win that. The whole point of Jesus coming is not simply to snatch our souls out of this world so they can go off and live in a disembodied spirit realm of angelic beings. Rather, it's that he redeems us and his plan is to redeem the earth itself. So how far will redemption reach? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, Isaac Watts was not just a great hymn writer, he's a great theologian, and uh, he nailed it in Joy to the World, where he says, far as the curse is found. That's how far redemption goes. Far as the curse is found. God's redemptive plan includes not only human beings, but all the groaning creation, people and animals and the earth itself, and God will not abandon his creation he will redeem it. Isaiah 65, 17 says, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. And just eight verses later, it says this, The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. This is Eden restored and Eden magnified. And a lot of people only apply those verses about the animals in uh, Isaiah 65 and, and other passages to uh, a, a thousand year millennial kingdom. Now, a lot of people have different beliefs on this and we don't have to believe the same thing about the millennium. Uh, there's amillennialists and there's uh, post-millennialists and pre-millennialists. I believe in a literal millennium, but I don't believe that that's exclusively what this passage is talking about. And the big clue is it says it's talking about the new earth. So yeah, there's things in that passage that have to be understood and interpreted in light of that reality. But nevertheless, we're told that all creation is going to be in harmony. And that's the way God designed it. And it was experienced by only a, a couple of people and those original animals in the garden. But 2 Peter 3 tells us 
we are looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I mean, righteousness, uh, the world full of righteousness. Now, when the Bible talks about a new earth, some people act as if, well, it's, isn't, I mean, it's not going to be like a real earth. It's not going to be like this earth. Well, think about this. If I say I'm going to give you a new car, which I'm not going to, but if I said that, um, uh, what would you think? Would you think, well, that car isn't going to have uh, uh, an engine and it's not going to have a transmission and it's not going to have uh, a steering wheel. It's not going to have brakes and it's not going to have. No, if, if it didn't have those things, it wouldn't be a car. A car is a car. A new car is a car. A new body will be a body. We know this. Look at the body of Jesus. They recognized him. He had the, 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 the body parts. He had hands and feet. He was showing them. He was, he was fixing meals and eating them with them. Uh, so a new body is a body. A new earth will be what? An earth. First and foremost, it will be an earth, not an honor. Uh, see, new is the adjective, uh, and uh, earth is the noun, and nouns are the main thing. Um, God would not call it uh, a new earth if it was not a real earth. Uh, God has a good vocabulary, and he knows how to use words, okay? Uh, our bodies are going to be destroyed at death, right? But they will be resurrected so that the new bodies are the old bodies made new. We know that. Christ's resurrection body was the same body that died. How do we know that? Because the tomb was empty and because he showed them the scars. Now, I don't think any others of us will have scars from this life, but he took our sufferings and our sin upon himself. And, and that's the story of redemption. But in any case, we're told in 2 Peter 3, the old earth, the earth we're on right now, that earth under the curse, that earth will be destroyed. So some people say, well, then what are you talking about an earth in our future? Well, that's what the new earth is, because the old earth that's destroyed will be raised in the form of the new earth, just as our old bodies will be raised in the form of our new bodies. So um, there's an irony, and that is that people today often, um, you know, edit uh, the Bible to make it sort of say and mean supposedly what they want it to, to fit their desires. But the really truly ironic thing is that what the Bible actually teaches about heaven is far more attractive than what we usually believe. Yeah, there's the present heaven. That's where we go when we die. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Wonderful. That's a, that's a great thing. To, to die and be with Christ, Paul says, is better by far. That's the present heaven where God dwells now, where God's throne is now, where God's people dwell now. But here's the radical teaching of the, of the Bible. Revelation 19, there will be resurrection. And after the resurrection, there will be, Revelation 21, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And that, and then, God will relocate, we'll talk about this in a couple of minutes, but will relocate heaven from where it is presently, the present heaven, to the new earth. And all his resurrected people will live on this new earth. The reason why we don't go immediately to the new earth when we die is the resurrection hasn't happened yet. And God creates the new earth after the resurrection says, here's my place for you to live forever, and I will dwell with you. So one of the greatest gifts we can give our, our children and our grandchildren is to teach them the doctrine of the resurrection and the new earth, and teach them they're made for a person and a place. Jesus is the person, heaven, and ultimately the new earth, the, the eternal heaven, uh, is, is the place they were made for. So God made Adam from the earth and he made him for the earth and he made him to walk on the earth and to rule the earth along with Eve. And that was not a mistake. And that's why a platonic uh, disembodied uh, spirit, which the Bible does not teach at all, is just uh, 
not the satisfactory answer. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if there is no resurrection, we are of all people most to be pitied. So our physical sufferings on earth uh, just can't be rectified by a disembodied existence in, a, in another world. These very bodies that suffered will be raised and live without suffering on the new earth. And, and in that promise of the new earth in Revelation 21 in verse 4, uh, Jesus says he will wipe away the tears from every eye. And I think not just the tears from our eyes, but the reason for the tears and all the suffering. It says there will be no more suffering. There will be no more pain. There will be no more death. And Revelation 22 says no more sin. The curse will be lifted. Um, what a beautiful thing it will be. So God's ultimate plan of redemption is not relocating us as disembodied spirits to live forever in an angelic realm, but to bring us down ultimately to a new earth that he will create where we will live as resurrected believers. We, meaning we who know Christ. Now, you do need to place your faith in Christ. This is not a heaven is automatically for everybody uh, because the Bible teaches that we're sinners, but for the redeemed people of God who have accepted the gift of eternal life offered by Jesus Christ, uh, redemption is not the end of life in this world. Ultimately, it brings us back to, for eternal life in this world. So the exact wording of Revelation 21, actually, I'm going to uh, take parts of uh, the first four verses, is that then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So you see, that's an explicit statement that heaven will be relocated from where it is now, what we call the present heaven or intermediate heaven, sometimes theologians call it, and he will bring it down. He will bring heaven down to earth, literally heaven on earth. Will there be heaven on earth? Well, we can't make it that way. Human beings won't make it heaven on earth, but God will bring heaven down to earth. And then it says, I heard a loud voice calling from the throne, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And that means all men and women, mankind. And then he says it twice more. God will dwell with them. Where? On the new earth. And God himself will be with them. Again, he says it three times in one verse. But for some reason, we some, sometimes just don't, don't get it. But that's what it's saying. God will come down and dwell with us on the new earth, and he will relocate his throne there. We see his throne in Revelation 22. Uh, his new dwelling place, Revelation 21, will be on the earth. Well, where is heaven? Heaven is wherever God's throne and dwelling place are. So the present heaven is going, uh, you know, when, when we when we die, uh, if we know Jesus, and we go to live with God, what we're doing is we're going to live with God in his place. And that's the way we routinely think of heaven. And for now, that's true. We go to live with God in his place. But the new earth that is promised in Revelation 21 and 22 and Isaiah 65 and 2 Peter 3.13 and other places in the Bible, the new earth is God coming down to live with us in our place and bringing his people down to planet earth, redeemed earth, new earth, to live with us in our place. And that's Emmanuel. Remember that name of Jesus? God with us. So it's not ultimately the eternal heaven is not us going up to live in, with God in his place. It's God coming down to live with us in our place. And the resurrected Christ, the king of humanity, the king of kings, ruling over the new earth, and under him is kings and queens, uh, you know, uh, ruling uh, some who have been faithful uh, in this much, uh, who are ruling over five cities, and some ruling over ten cities, and, and dwelling together and celebrating uh, on that new earth. It says his servants will serve him. You think it's going to be boring? No. Servants always have things to do, places to go, people to see. You only think of heaven as boring if you think it as drifting around in this uh, spirit realm that wasn't really made for human beings. 
of God has made a place for us and the ultimate place. For now, he's made a place for us in the present heaven. It's, it's a great, wonderful place. But he's going to relocate it to the new earth. So this is the, the marvelous truth. And Lewis saw this. He saw it. In, he wrote about it in Mere Christianity. He said, Christianity is almost the only one of the great religions which thoroughly approves of the body, which believes that matter is good, that God himself once took on a human body, and that some kind of body is going to be given us even in heaven and is going to be an essential part of our happiness, our beauty, and our energy. So new bodies without the new earth would make no sense whatsoever. Physical bodies aren't meant to float around in a spirit realm. We need to walk on ground, eating and drinking. Jesus talks about in God's kingdom, uh, eating and drinking uh, six or seven times in the gospels. In the four loves, uh, Lewis wrote, we may hope that the resurrection of the body also means the resurrection of what may be called our greater body, the general fabric of our earthly life with its affections and relationships. Well, it's not just that we may hope. I mean, I'll go so far as to say we have clear, biblically revealed reasons to believe in the resurrection of our greater body. You know, not just our physical body, but the greater body that he met was the earth itself. And Lewis talked about the present heaven more than he talked about the new earth. Actually, in some ways, the only place other than illusions or hints like this that I just read, the only place he really talks about the new earth, but he talks about it gloriously, is in the form of the new Narnia at the end of um, the last battle, the final of the, of the Narnian books. But uh, even if, again, if we weren't told there's going to be a new earth, we, we'd almost have to suppose there was, because where are all these new bodies going to live? Where are we going to be when we eat and drink? I mean, aren't we going to have tables, and isn't there going to be a floor, and isn't there going to be ground to live in, uh, to live on? And the answer is yes. The resurrection, the man's new earth, the body promises it. Uh, do we see this in scripture? Oh, absolutely. Isaiah 60, Isaiah 65, Revelation 21, 22. They all talk about the new earth. And at the end of Revelation 21, uh, it talks about God's uh, children ruling the earth because it talks about the kings of the nations of the earth will bring their glory into the new Jerusalem. And its gates will never be shut, and they will bring into its splendors and the honor of the nations. Well, what are these splendors? I think I think they're probably tributes, uh, people making stuff, creativity continuing. We'll still be in the image of God, and we'll be um, all the more in the image of God in the sense that sin will not in any way tarnish us or hold us back, hold back our imagination and our, our creativity. So I think they'll bring in tributes to the King of Kings. Revelation 22 um, says uh, his servants will serve him. Well, that's redeemed work and, and redeemed rest and redeemed eating and drinking. And if all that, and we know all that, uh, why not redeemed culture and redeemed agriculture and redeem music and arts and science and play and writing and reading and redeemed exploration of the world all to the glory of God. If the, if the current universe declares the, handy, the glory of God in his handiwork, how much more in a, in a universe no longer under the curse? You, do you love the beauty of this earth? I mean, I do. I love to, to, to dive. I love to snorkel for hours on end. Can't do a lot of that in Oregon. But, you know, and it's just more something I, I thrill to enjoy. And you may love flowers and gardens. And I think we all love forests and, and, and the great um, lakes of the world, all of that. Well, if there's going to be a new earth and a new Jerusalem, which we're told there's going to be, well, why not a new Mount Everest? Why not a new Lake Victoria? Why not a new Grand Canyon? Uh, in Matthew 19, Jesus said, these are his words, at the renewal of all things. Now, 
all things in the Greek means all things, which is why all the Greek experts translate it all things. Um, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes. See, renewal is one of the many rewords in the Bible. There's redemption, regeneration, restoration, reconciliation, resurrection. Sometimes we miss those RE words because of the way that we you know, pronounce them, but re it means going back. It doesn't mean creating something that's never been. It means restoring something that's been lost, and now it's in a better than ever form. And in Acts 3.21, Peter said, Christ must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Again, it's not, he's, his mission is not obliteration, it's restoration. So what does it mean that one day God will restore everything? Well, again, it means this biblical doctrine of the new earth. And the great thing is, that if we realize this, we will no longer have to have bucket lists. We will no longer have to grab for everything we can grab in this world because, you know, you only go around once. And this is our only opportunity to really experience the wonders and joys and beauties of this world. No, it's not. The best is yet to come. So if you're disappointed because there were things you really would have liked to do, that things that were on your bucket list, and now you're realizing you're not going to be able to because your own uh, health, maybe your spouse's health, um, your financial situation, whatever it is, for whatever reasons, you can't do some of the things you long to do. The best is yet to come. And, and, and we do not pass our peaks in this life. Don't, don't let the evil one fool you into thinking that you have passed your peak. So I'm 66 years old now. Uh, I go out and play tennis with my grandsons, but you know what? Um, I'm slowing down. I mean, I can't play tennis the way I used to. And sometimes my mind tells me I can, and that's when I get in trouble and hurt myself because I try to force my body to do something it can't do anymore. But my point is, I'd be depressed if I thought that I had passed my peak. Well, here's the thing. Not only have I not passed my peak, I have never seen my peak. My peak will not come until the resurrection and I will never be less than at my peak. And the same is true for all of us. That's just a doctrine of scripture. He's gonna wipe away the suffering and, and, and the results of the curse with the curse gone. We will not experience the results of it the way that we do in this earth. So. When you think of heaven, don't think of, well, there won't be any pain because we'll just be spirits without bodies. And if you don't have a body, you can't have pain. And we'll be floating around. And it's like, we think of heaven as the absence of the negative. Let's think of the promise of the new earth as the presence of the positive. Most importantly, of course, being with Jesus. Most importantly, worshiping him the King of kings and Lord of lords, our Savior, our King, worthy of all a worship, but all the missed opportunities of this life that will be replaced by billions of better opportunities forever. So um, when you think about the promise of heaven, think about the amazingly good news that God is as in store for us, a redeemed physical world. You know, no, no child wants to grow up to be a ghost. So if, if we give our children the impression that heaven is this ghostly existence where uh, all we do is, you know, sing hymns forever and strum a harp, which I guess a ghost really can't strum a harp, but, you know, you get the idea. And it's going to be boring. No. The greatest adventures await us in the world to come. In letters to Malcolm, Lewis said this, I can now communicate to you the fields of my boyhood. Boyhood, They are building estates today. Only imperfectly can I tell you about them by words. Perhaps the day is coming when I can take you for a walk through them. So he suggests the continuity between this earth and the new earth. Um, but I think in the last battle, and I'll just give you a little bit of this because I'm starting to run out of time here. 
Uh, Jewel the Unicorn mourns Narnia's death, calling it the only world I've ever known. God put us here. We met Christ here. He revealed himself. So this is the only world we've ever known. And in the last battle, Lewis says this, the new Narnia was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. What a picture of the new earth. Will it be different? Of course, it'll be different. But on the new earth, we will say, as Lewis had it said of those in Narnia, the reason we love the old earth is that sometimes it looked a little like this. And Eustace, by the way, was puzzled because he said, you know, we saw Narnia destroyed. We saw the sun put out. How can you say this is Narnia? And, and, and then they say, well, yeah, but it actually is because look at all the familiar places. Well, Second Peter 3 says the old earth will be destroyed and the same context promises the new earth, which will never die. So what do we find in the final two chapters of the Bible? A wrap up, a return to the first two chapters, but far more and far better. In Revelation 21 and 22, we see the river of the water of life flowing from the throne of God and the tree of life, which by then is a forest of life growing on both sides of the river, the new Eden, no longer any curse. Um, the Redeemer has come and righteous humanity is now going to rule the new earth under King Jesus forever. So the great news is if we know Jesus, that's where we're going to be. And so uh, let me finish where uh, Lewis finishes the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, and what a picture of what awaits us in, in the world to come, uh, for sure. And by the way, remember, you say Lewis is writing fiction, but God is writing in Revelation 21 and 22 and these other passages, God is writing blood-bought promises. It is by the blood of Jesus that these truths and these eternal realities are guaranteed. But just, just kind of luxuriate in, uh, as I have, as I was just rereading this this morning, in a section called uh, Farewell to the Shadowlands, uh, Aslan gives the children shocking news. It's really ultimately good news. He says, there was a real railway, railway accident. Remember, that's how the book began, and it seemed like there was an accident, but you didn't know. And then he says, your father and mother, and all of you are, as you used to call it in the Shadowlands, dead. The term is over. The holidays have begun. Have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. And Lewis says, and as he spoke, the great lion, he no longer looked to them like a lion. Guess what he began to look like? I think the Savior, Jesus. He no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Can't wait. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Randy, for that uh, wonderful presentation.